The new normal requires new networking strategies to reopen, remobilize, and rebuild operations using human ingenuity, inspired creativity, and applied digital innovation. Join us for an exchanging of ideas and a showcase of strategies from our customers across multiple industries. Welcome to our live webinar, Adapting and Implementing the New Normal for Education. Thank you all for joining us today. Education institutions across the globe have responded gracefully to distant learning. Now, as they prepare for the fall semester, digital transformation has taken on a whole new meaning in and out of the classroom. Educators are adopting and leveraging new technology at unprecedented rates, realizing the silver linings for student engagement, individualized learning, and flexibility through distant learning models. K through 12 and higher education are applying technology strategically and creatively. I'm joined today by Richard Webb, CTO with Fremont Public Schools, Bruce Gillum, Superintendent at Shady Point School District, and Dr. Bassam El Haddade, Director of IT Services at Leeds Beckett University. Thank you all so much for joining me today. I look forward to hearing your insights throughout this discussion and what you're planning for the upcoming school year. So you all have experienced so many changes so fast since March to now. So I really would like to start with the flexible learning that's been redefined in education since this, the course of the pandemic and as you prepare for the fall semester. My first question is for you, Rick. What did distant learning reveal in efficacy regarding the individualized learning opportunities between students and the teachers? So for us, it was very eye-opening with so many things because as a district, we did not do much with one-to-one uh, -one, uh, device uh, per student type uh, scenarios and we didn't have many devices going home. Uh, it was very specialized when they did. Um, so one of the things that we had to do was pivot very quickly um, to provide a um, statewide mandated virtual session uh, that was then delivered uh, whether it was through technology, uh, using different LMS platforms, um, or was provided by pencil and paper via school buses delivering lunches uh, to every kid and then picking those up as the bus comes back to deliver lunch the next day. Um, so uh, being in a rural community with a lot of, uh, well, 60% plus uh, free and reduced lunch population, uh, so a lot of uh, uh, below poverty level income families, um, there were a lot of challenges. And I think one of the things we learned with doing the distance learning, um, once we had students not in the classroom, basically in a virtual classroom, uh, we saw that there were some students that maybe engaged in the classroom, maybe they engaged differently in a virtual environment, and some students that maybe never got a chance to speak or even engaged within that classroom environment, but somehow in this virtual environment started to engage and thrive in a way that maybe they hadn't before. Um, and so I thought that was an interesting takeaway from, from what we learned, something we weren't really expecting to see, uh, but I just thought that was something very interesting. Yeah, so a situation which was meant to cause disruption actually enabled the instructors or the teachers to really understand the context of the students that they weren't getting in the classroom before. I'm sure that was a positive outlook towards the, the shift in adaptation to distant learning. Absolutely. Dr. Bassam, my question for you is, you know, with the situation that Rick just described and how to communicate with the students and engage with them, provide their nece the necessities that they were accustomed to getting in person within the school. There's IT resources that support in-person learning, but with this shift to distant learning, there must have been some stress on IT resources that weren't designed for these types of use cases. Was there any stress you noticed amongst educators and or yourself at Leeds Beckett? Um, I wouldn't say it is stress. Um, there was a bit of a mixed excitement and uh, colleagues who rose to the occasion in terms of uh, doing the, more, if you like, to ensure that the institution is able to deliver the, or to, to shift from face-to-face -to, -face to online learning. 
in a very short period of time. And uh, my institution, for example, we, we, we've been uh, in a way uh, lucky as well because we had the foresight to uh, start the planning for a lockdown about a couple of weeks before uh, lockdown itself, which enabled us to bring up the infrastructure, if you like, to cope with the demand, the extra demand that's going to be uh, expected from moving from place to place to uh, remote uh, teaching. I mean, when you are on campus, you are expected to have a certain number of uh, users accessing the systems internally, but coming out from uh, externally to the, to the campus remotely, that put quite a lot of stress on the network. But as, as you know, I mean, uh, we have a fantastic uh, infrastructure. Uh, part yeah. of it is supplied by Extreme itself. Uh, with extreme fabric so our infrastructure has has been able to cope with the demand other institutions have struggled yes uh, because it caught a lot of people on un, un, um, unaware if you like uh, and unprepared for that sort of uh, shift and it's a it's a it's a seismic shift uh, if one Absolutely. could say that yeah, yeah. seismic understatement right <laughs> <laughs> As, yeah. as, the, as you continue to uh, in, respond to these seismic shift, yeah. shift uh, there's, there's something that I'm noticing on the rise within education, and we're calling it digital classrooms. Yeah. The classrooms were equipped with projectors and uh, technology that would augment yeah. the classroom, yeah. but yeah. it hasn't been really designed for a digital classroom where instructors could potentially record their, their lectures stream their lectures. Will this type of classroom become the new standard in education? Um, uh, you could say it, it, it will be, but I think it's uh, one, what COVID-19 has uh, done to the sector, higher education, is to, to change a culture uh, that would have taken years to change uh, in a positive way, if you like. Um, so when we, when we and when uh, who knows when that is going to be, when, when we ever go back to campus. I think the, the digital classroom will be part and parcel of what we do. It, uh, education and teaching w has changed forever. So you will, you will have the asynchronous uh, way of teaching and the synchronous way of teaching, but also you will have the face-to-face -face teaching because uh, in many subject areas, you cannot really uh, replace the face-to-face -face interaction. So it will be a mixture of the three. Then you add to it the technology that we've been talking about uh, in terms of uh, the software that will enable us to record lectures. Many institutions and, uh, would have been recording lectures for a number of years, but to enable it, uh, the access, if you like, the live access to that, uh, content is new to the majority of universities who, who were mainly face-to-face. -face. So you've got the, the technology and then you, you will uh, notice, to, you will start to notice that the, the change in the way we interact and uh, with the students, tutor and tutees have changed the engagement of students. What we noticed since the lockdown that the student engagement with the way, with the new way of uh, learning uh, based on the, t uh, the digital uh, capabilities that we have, have gone up significantly. So it, it, in a way you could say it's a bless uh, that this has happened in terms of e student engagement and student attendance as well. So face to face, you might, if, if a student uh, had a good night uh, the night before, uh, have an 8.30 lecture in the morning, it's difficult to, to get into. Uh, the swing of things, whereas now remotely they are able to do that. So, yes. uh, so the classroom, yes, it's it's changed forever, but it's changed to the positive. And what uh, I think when we talk about digital, uh, there is something else that has changed significantly, and and that is the culture within uh, academia, if you like, uh, the resistance, the reserve, uh, be, uh, academics being reserved or a bit timid uh, adopting technology in, in the teaching uh, environment. So that's a plus. 
Yeah, absolutely. The technology has always been there, but it's the application mm -hmm. of the technology, technology. Yeah. and the cultural shift that has uh, accelerated the adoption through out of necessity and mm -hmm. also in that process have learned really the efficacies of what it could provide from a flexible learning experience, mm -hmm. uh, you know, efficiency of, of delivering the, the lectures or the classes, and for the students having the yeah. option to review the content after the class yeah. and not struggle to take notes as I once did rapidly before they switched the slide yeah. on the projector. And, and one thing to add is with all the technology, I think there are a number of courses where you have accreditation uh, bodies that will have to, will have a big say in how much uh, digital, you, you go down the digital route and how much is it going, it has to stay face to face as well. So th these are, needs to be taken into account. Yes, and that's why I see digital classrooms on the rise um, yeah. through those mandates of distant learning and occupancy management, et cetera, but also in that process, we're really enjoying that flexibility. Gotcha. Bruce, I'd love your input on this as superintendent. How has blended learning been redefined into what some are calling, as we've mentioned, the hybrid learning models? How is that going to take effect in K-12 education in your school district? Well, traditionally, you've got blended learning is, it's almost like it was an augmentation, an afterthought to education. And then we, what traditionally is called hybrid is where a course was designed kind of from the beginning, almost on a 50-50 split to be a digital, to have digital content. Uh, but in the context of COVID and, and the current trends in education, these definitions are thrown out the window. Um, I think, and in our case, I think we're transitioning to a, a new definition of hybrid learning that's based more on the transitions between uh, traditional and digital context. Uh, for us, learning is a system where the student has to transition in and out of the classroom. It may be three, 10, 14 days, we don't know. Um, but our teachers really have to uh, plan, their, plan their content delivery, uh, not knowing where that student is gonna be at any given time. So the only difference is the medium in which they're, they're, they're conveying their digital content. Uh, so it's, it's almost like the seamless transition between traditional and digital is a new hybrid. Um, so you've got, you've got the old fashioned way of, of, of technology as an afterthought or technology as, as a forethought. Um, and I think we're moving where we're, like, like, like we said earlier, um, we're getting very rapid movement. We're getting very quick buy-in. Uh, everybody's on board now. And, and a, a process that would have taken year, a good year, 18 months to ramp up, we ramped up in weeks. Uh, so uh, we kind of have to uh, do a little bit of planning and hopefully uh, we can uh, provide education to wherever our students are and give them whatever they need. Yes, it's exciting times to, in education to, for you know, the, what it means, the outcome of the students. How have your students responded in this transition and what are your, what are your anticipations for the fall in the adoption of the changes that continue to come? Uh, I'm expecting a slow, still slow transition. Uh, I, we're a very rural community. Uh, very, uh, our, our parents, um, in most part, were there. Uh, we had engagement, for the, our engagement varied. Uh, and I'll talk about it probably a little later. I'll, I'll probably talk about it a whole lot more. It varied with how involved the parents were. Uh, it's always, education always boils down to how involved your kids and your parents are. Uh, the more involved they are, the more, the more engaged their students were. Uh, we did see technology play a role as our, our older kids, especially, they had the ability to utilize technology a little easier and they were able to get themselves in online and in, in the classrooms like they need to, whereas our younger students, they, they rely on their parents a little more to get that done for them. So uh, I expect that transition to still be a little slower. We're still going to have packets. Uh, we'll still have a little mix of technology and packets, but that's based on our, our uh, geographic location. So uh, it's... And it's dynamic. We'll give it a week and we'll see where we are a week from now. But it's going to be, uh, it'll be a challenge, but it's, it's, as long as we do what's best for our kids, we'll be fine. Absolutely. It's a moving target right now. We, we know that. And in support of education, uh, we recognize that you have to stay agile in your operations to adapt swiftly as those changes continue to evolve. <laughs> that target moves just a little bit more as we all, you know, prepare to transition back in phases. Right. But related to those digital trends that we've been talking about, I want to circle back to the digital classroom with uh, you, Dr. Bassam. Yeah. You talked about it becoming uh, a new standard over time. 
uh, at a more rapid pace than we've seen before, but what are the specific components that would make up a digital classroom? Well, uh, you, you, we, first, uh, as we said earlier, we talked about the space itself. Uh, so you're talking about the physical space and the digital space, but also you're talking about personalization of, of the learning process as well. So you've got those three components uh, of what we call digital space. Then part of that is the, t the technology where you've got the tools that uh, the student and uh, the tutors will be using to, uh, to learn and teach. Um, but then the accessibility part of that digital classroom. Um, I, I, I think uh, we, um, sometimes we assume that every student will have access to digital uh, devices uh, that will enable them to uh, to access all of this uh, teaching and then uh, and learning material um, but in fact there is quite a proportion of our student body I'm talking about the UK in particular where they come from low uh, income um, families or they were the first person to be into higher education and they don't have the the financial uh, aspect of being able to provide for themselves the kit. So we need to address that digital poverty um, or, or what we call it, students who are digitally disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged by uh, the move to um, digital classrooms, etc. And that falls uh, on the university to, to make sure that these students are not disadvantaged and they have the uh, the ability to learn uh, in, in equal terms, if you like, equal playing fields. Uh, we also talked about the engagement uh, and the feedback loop uh, for the digital classroom. That becomes more instantaneous. Um, the feedback, uh, is, uh, the students will appreciate feedback. Usually now, uh, before COVID-19, it takes time. Uh, and uh, now it is with the technology that we are using, it becomes more immediate. So these are, if you like, the components of uh, what we call a digital classroom in the, of the future. So it's the remote accessibility, it's the feedback mm -hmm. loop, the communication. Yeah. What about the, the in-classroom experience? You know, when you walk into a classroom today, you expect to see if it's a small classroom, you have some means to project information onto a screen so that the larger classroom can see it. Um, so we're, we're used to those things. We're used to yeah. having uh, Wi-Fi for connectivity, yeah. but we're, we're not necessarily used to having, say, AVB technology and uh, you know a pervasive high density connectivity for, yeah. say, streaming. So the microphones might be a factor, the audio and visual uh, video components of the classroom would mm -hmm. be a factor in order to enable those, those instructors to stream their classes or at least record their classes for on-demand viewing. Is that going to take shape inside of the classroom as well? I think uh, absolutely, because uh, what you want is the, the tutor to have access to the tools where if, the, if you are running a hybrid class uh, where some students are remote, some students are face-to-face, -face, uh, then you need to have that technology. We, most, most classrooms have uh, smart boards, uh, smart technology in place, so you don't need projection facilities. You use most, you know, and you share, students do share access, you, you know, give control to students. So the, uh, you, you talked about connectivity and bandwidth. And that becomes really important because what we're looking at is more of a, a Wi-Fi network that is good enough to, uh, for the streaming and the number of students at the same time, simultaneously streaming videos, streaming uh, learning material, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, uh, some institution might be better than others in terms of the provision. Um, what we have done, for example, with the technology that we have, um, I'm going to be uh, to sound like a, a salesman for extreme, <laughs> but but what we what we've done is we we thinking about moving uh, some of the access points down because the, some buildings won't be used for a while. So what we want to do is to move access points from areas where it's not being used to ensure that we have a better uh, coverage. 
that will enable students to do streaming uh, with uninterrupted streaming as well. So yeah, that's the technology that we are looking at. That, that makes sense. You have to repurpose for the space that that's is important. not being leveraged. We don't yeah. want wasted space and technology being purposed in an area that's not being used um, yeah. because it's very critical right now for all of our use cases. And I, I think that you're, you're absolutely right. It's uh, the accessibility, the feedback loop, and the digital um, you know, audio visual broadcasting yeah. technology inside of the classroom to enable those types of recorded learnings and streaming uh, sessions yeah. as well. Rick, I have a question for you uh, on the same thread of this digital classroom and that feedback loop he was talking about. How will we see technology be infused into not just the classroom, but also the curriculum itself? Well, I think one of the things we've kind of touched on it all uh, through these conversations so far, uh, we've been trying to implement technology in the classroom uh, and adopt it, integrate it, wh whatever buzzwords were used at the time for probably over 10 years in both K-12 and higher ed. And I think we in the technology side of things have struggled with uh, seeing the low rate of adoption, and I'm sure others outside of our sector as well, but we, especially in technology, put in a lot of work and effort to set up the infrastructure and then see lack of adoption, lack of time. It, it, it's, it's all sorts of things. It's time for adoption, all of these sorts of challenges that we have to really getting uh, teachers specifically and other staff to be able to, number one, understand and have the time to be trained for these uh, types of things uh, and then be able to then embrace and adopt these things and use them in their everyday teaching. Um, and I think, as you were saying, Basim, the, the blessing or as we have now with this COVID-19 situation, it's become the catalyst to really drive all of this innovation that we've been mm -hmm. trying to achieve and really get all the players to come together and start to make some of these things happen. And so speaking towards that, towards, you know, how is the technology going to be infused in the classroom? Well, now we're really having to use, to, especially if, if we end up in a hybrid model, you have to use technology to be able to uh, provide these services because your only other avenue is to somehow have just half the class there or less and somehow have the other half there, and then the teacher has to give the exact same content. You've just doubled the amount of hours mm -hmm. that that teacher needs to be able to provide content, and we don't have a way to provide for paying the teacher for extra hours, having more hours in the day. There, there are just some certain constraints there where we almost have to turn to technology to provide this need, whether that's splitting kids into multiple classrooms and doing distance learning on site that way with you know, what we used to call closed circuit, uh, type of scenario or having half the kids of the class at home in a hybrid environment and half the kids in class and then rotate which kids are in and mm -hmm. maybe experience in the class and remote is slightly different but at least there's a piece of that that remains consistent across the virtual or in in person experience right. um, and so yeah. you know, there's a lot more I could talk about but I don't want to go too far we've got more questions <laughs> we do have more questions and you guys are I'm, I'm enjoying all of the input from each of your perspectives and the the schools and the districts that you represent and the regions as well but what you're saying it really resonates with me because it's I'm thinking about our personal life right how we engage uh, on a day-to-day -day basis how students or outside of school engage with each other how they access learning materials that are outside of the classroom and I can see that that would be not only infused as you as you described but the curriculum being shaped going mm -hmm. forward uh, by the technology that we're leveraging because they're teaching on subjects that would potentially prepare them with skill sets for the outside world for the post-grad life and those skill sets that they were are preparing for are going to also have technology infused more and more into the business operations and models of every industry. So I can see that shaping the curriculum as well over time, that mm -hmm. they're applying new skill sets in that curriculum for the students to learn that would prepare them for this digital world that we are definitely in. Sorry to mean interrupt. And we can also, and you, that, that's, it's the skill set that they're learning is also important. We're seeing plenty of kids where the first exposure to Zoom meetings or 
or any variation of, of online interaction, that's now becoming commonplace in workplaces as well. We're seeing many right. businesses switch over and at least mm -hmm. do partial tele, you know, telework or become impartial or full time. That's part of a new movement and we're exposing our kids to those skill sets as well. Yeah, that's a great point. It's exactly uh, the excitement that I get from this evolution is, wow, these kids are gonna come out with skill sets that aren't gonna shock or with skill sets that will prepare them and not shock them as they enter into the workforce that, wait, what, what is Zoom? What is video conferencing? How should I send this email? It gives them very practical skills to um, easily go into corporate America or whatever field of choice that they have, you know, post-grad life through their, through their schooling. Bruce, uh, I wanna expand on that a little bit and talk about the student activities and engagement. Are we going to be applying the same concepts that are enabling us to engage with the student in the classroom, outside of the classroom? We know that student engagement is critical to their performance and their retention. All activities in person are put on hold for a while. How will this be applied for those purposes? Well, it's gonna be hard. <laughs> we'll start with that one. Uh, when it comes to education, we tend to be hyper-focused on our core instruction. Uh, we sometimes forget all the other little things they experience at school, um, whether it's these, this that latest evolution of soft skills that's becoming with, with exposure to, to, to tele whatever. Um, and, and then we'll look, if we're looking at this new hybrid lens of instruction, we're only beginning to understand what we need our kids to learn. Uh, the good thing is, is students are very social and technology uh, and lets them enhance that. Uh, like we've used group meetings, we give them time, we expose them to telemedicine, we, we try to uh, throw anything that they might experience uh, further on in life at them early so they understand it. Uh, and, and of course, as you can expect, um, students are very good at utilizing technology for, for social interaction. They don't seem to have a problem with that. Uh, maybe keeping them on task is a problem. Uh, and, and, and that seems to be our biggest problem is keeping them engaged and on task. Uh, we're trying to find new ways to make it fun and exciting while not forgetting that core instruction model that we have to, to, have to convey in them. Um, we focus on providing that foundation of education that they need later on. Uh, we have to get that across to them. Uh, moving forward for us in education, uh, in Oklahoma was kind of unique when we shut down at the end, at, at the end of last school year in the spring, our students were held harmless, which means whatever grades they had at, at about spring break, they locked in. They could go up, but they couldn't go down. Uh, so the kids have that in their mindset that, well, it, it's not going to affect my grade. I don't have to do it. Uh, we have to break that mindset very fast. Um, we, have to make, we have to ensure our students are engaged in their lessons and not their social interactions. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think some of our classes, we got a lot of content out there, but it was as much getting kids exposed to other kids, especially when we were in complete lockdown and it was no interaction, you know, for, for the month or two that it was, that was the only way they were getting contact was through their social medias or whether it was group classes or uh, small group sessions that we were doing with kids. So uh, technology is allowing us to communicate in ways that we've never been able to before at the speed that we've never been able to before. And it's changing the way they interact and, and we are, public education has always been a, a mirror of society. We have to change the way we instruct in order to do that, so. Oh, well said, it, it, music to my ears. And what you were talking about, if the students, if the students don't have the same motivation and peer mm -hmm. pressure that they did inside of the classroom to finish their studies, to you know, complete a task or a project, how can that be driven when they're in these flexible environments and where really students have to find new reasons for motivation, mm -hmm. new, uh, new means for, for their purpose and, and excitement for the, the classes and what I see happening in the future, which I'm really excited to see take place, is the curriculums being mapped to very specific applied learning opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. It's math is math. And unless you just love math, which is rare, or science, or pick a subject, right? We each have our inclinations. And until it's applied to a student to explain to them, this is how you can leverage this skill set. I know it seems like it's an isolated pocket of knowledge that we're asking you to hold in your head, 
but think about how you can apply that to any of the things that they are passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, think they might want to go into uh, interests that they would want to uh, evolve more and learn more about how to apply what they're learning in the classroom to those interests. And I think you have more opportunity to do that as our, you know, each of you have described throughout this discussion already that these flexible learning models give you more insight and context into the student's life, what their interests are, and then that hopefully leads way to how can we help them realize how exciting this learning could be for their passions. I mean, is that something you see happening as well? Exactly. I mean, it, we, we, we always try to move from an, an external uh, motivation to an intrinsic motivation. We want the kids to learn on their own. Uh, right. And that's always a hard thing to do. Uh, we've learned that, like you said, if you don't have, we always try to teach problem solving skills and real world applications, but if you don't have a base core knowledge, a, 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 you know, a, a tool bag of tools to pull from, you can't do problem solving later on. You've got to have a understanding and we always talk about you got to have a strong foundation on the base of our pyramid and all that stuff we can every whatever education metaphor you want to throw at us but that strong foundation lets you have applied skills later on and that's and that's where we struggle with trying to tie engagement and getting kids to be engaged especially at younger ages when they don't see how to apply later on so totally agree well you know there are some it considerations as well that take place we talked about the, the response, the shift, the adaptability of education institutions that we've seen across the board, the digital technologies that are on the rise for adoption within the classroom and outside of the classroom. But as I mentioned in the first part of our, of our discussion here, IT wasn't necessarily designed for this. So Rick, I would like to hear from you, what are the IT considerations that our IT teams within education should be looking at in order to support such an agile operation uh, and adaptability and flexibility within your operations for education? So for us, some of the, the considerations that we haven't really had to worry about was offsite infrastructure, um, having whether it's 4G hotspots for kids to get internet access, we weren't doing that in any large sense. Um, and we're still not yet, but we're talking about it now as a potential solution for a hybrid model where we have a significant number of kids at home where we need to provide some sort of broadband capability if they don't have it already. Um, and so one of the significant challenges with that is just us being in a rural community, the 4G access is somewhat limited when you really get out into the country. Um, and so, that is a consideration that we have where um, one of the potential solutions we've come up with, we have some, well, fortunately, just before all this uh, happened, we upgraded our entire wired and wireless network infrastructure and just put in all new extreme switches and AeroHive gear. Um, and we had extreme switches and AeroHive gear before that from 2011. But some of those old switches, so some of the old access points can actually uh, be used as a uh, router and access point and VPN uh, device. So we can take that old AP330 and throw it on a school bus because it's 12 volts native already. We can literally light it up and put a 4G modem in there and it can provide internet when you park the school bus wherever. Um, so that's one of our potential uh, ways to provide access. If we can get a school bus as close to where those kids are to where we can have kind of like a neighborhood Wi-Fi hotspot uh, for those kids, we can deploy some vehicles, whether they're school buses, whatever they are, somehow deploy those devices in a place that can be semi-public um, that they can access that. <clears throat> Another uh, consideration is on-premise. I'm fortunate to have the new equipment because we're going to have all of these new devices on site. Um, we're going to have more mobile devices that are on-premise that go off-premise and they're going to need to be supported in a higher density wireless environment, uh, as well as we're going to have more bandwidth considerations within our wired network and wireless networks. Um, so I'm happy to be poised with a brand new system that's designed with two to three times the capacity of the old one, um, that I'm, I'm well positioned, I think, to really keep up with that demand as it comes, uh, you know, if we end up back in school uh, this fall, let's hope so. Um, we can really start to take advantage of some of that infrastructure that we invested in. That's I mean, a great just, point. 
Basil, you have something to add, please? What I was going to say is part of the considerations is what I mentioned earlier about uh, a student's ability to have access to um, uh, the IT, if you like, or the tools. And what we've done, for example, at Leeds Beckett and many other universities have done is we created an IT hardship fund to enable students, for example, as you, uh, as you said, uh, Rick, uh, those who, uh, who, can't, who don't have a good broadband, for example, and they can't afford to upgrade to the next uh, level of, uh, uh, of broadband, the university have started to offer funds to help students uh, do that. So they can continue to learn uh, as the rest of their uh, peers, if you like, yeah. Yeah, great points, both of you. I love the, the engagement amongst the panel here. I, I think this is a, a very fruitful discussion for people to hear and understand what, where the direction of education is going and what those IT needs really should be focused mm -hmm. on. Rick, you talked about um, you know, connectivity for you know, central hubs in a public place to connect those that don't have access. Basim, you talked about the, uh, the, the misconception or the assumption that all these students have mm -hmm. devices at home that they can have the accessibility to engage in these hybrid learning models. But there's also the BYOD aspect of that, you know, from a security perspective, we're not, you're not now just focused on, on having the IT centers um, the way that you have before inside of your schools or the computers mm -hmm. that, that stay there and remain there, right? The students come and use them, but they are shared resources. Uh, with IT having to take con into, into consideration that these devices may be BYOD or take, checked out from the school, taken home, and uh, finding remote places to connect that are offered by the school themselves, this really lends toward a very distributed uh, networking model uh, that, like you said, wasn't necessarily the use case before. So I'm mm -hmm. sure that the IT considerations are going to expand into the security of those devices, how those students are leveraging those devices, and the, the, the management, network management of distributed access points across different neighborhoods, right? I'll pause that. I'm actually going to redirect it to you, Bruce. And I know this is not something mm -hmm. that, I, that I put into, into our discussion of, of prep and questions before, but I've heard that this is becoming a, a rising challenge for educators with remote learning, remote access. What about cheating? How, how is that going to be managed? Mm -hmm. Talking about IT security, you know, and knowing what the students are doing on these devices, how is that going to be addressed from an IT consideration perspective? It's going to be real similar to the way we would, we would handle homework in general. Uh, traditionally, we would not weight homework as heavy as we would in, in class context. Uh, we've been relying very heavily on our, our learning management systems, whatever version, whatever school wants to use, using um, testing and when it comes to papers, we're going to use plagiarism software. We're going to throw everything that we, we're going to leverage the tools we have to make sure that a plagiarism and cheating doesn't occur, but we're not going to stop it. I mean, what it's going to come down to is in, when our teachers engage with the students, uh, one-on-one -on -one small groups, we spend our entire day assessing the students. Whether it's a formal assessment or a substantive assessment, whether it's an informal assessment during a conversation, we're able to gauge where our students are and what they've learned without them knowing it most often. It's not all, our assessments aren't always gonna be tied to a traditional uh, paper and pencil uh, answer the question accordingly. Uh, so it, it's, it's gonna be a learning curve on some of that. Uh, our teachers want to tr go in that traditional uh, method where it's an easy grade, we can put it in the book and move on. Uh, it's going to become a, a lot more informal in the way that we assess. If we're going to look at it, an individual student's needs, we're, we need to be able to assess that individual student on the fly through a conversation. Right. And a good teacher can do that very easily. Yeah, and like, like you all were talking about infusing the technology into the curriculum, maybe there is a different approach to how tests are, are conducted, right, with video. Basim, what do you think about this? Well, I mean... <laughs> We have, uh, in a number of schools, we have adopted um, online uh, tests where 
multiple, uh, on, you know, MSQs uh, that will uh, time uh, stamp as well. So students cannot really cheat much uh, in those uh, scenarios where you have a very time uh, limited uh, questions. Um, also, sometimes uh, you have the open book exams where no matter uh, what you do, you can have as many references open as possible, but you have a time, a timeline, if you like, to uh, submit your uh, answers uh, or uh, or assignment. Um, so it, it, it is it is difficult, as uh, Bruce said. You will not, you will never stop it, but you try and minimize it. And the tools that are available to check for plagiarism. Etc. is very sophisticated now. So, uh, and students know that uh, you know their career, their uh, future is on the line. The majority of them do not cheat. It's very very small amount who, uh, who do cheat if they do. Yeah. Right, and and for you, uh, from Leeds Beckett, you're talking about university students. So those yeah. that have gotten to the point where they're invested in their education, exactly. and from a K-12 perspective, you know. If you were like me as a kid, you didn't figure out that school was important until way later. Yeah. <laughs> and so in those cases, you know, you, you, they're still shaping their minds and Mind, yeah. still figuring out the character that they want to, to live by, right? So Bruce and Rick, I, I, this is where I'm, I'm curious about K-12 and how to enforce those things. And Rick, I'm thinking from an IT perspective, as you mentioned, the distributed networks, there's got to be a very significant emphasis on visibility and data insights across the network and all the devices that are on uh, being leveraged on the network and the students that are using those devices. So it sounds like this might lend towards a cloud model. Do you see education taking a step towards more adoption in cloud? Absolutely. I think um, one of the things that we're seeing uh, is a trend already uh, in education and far reaching the, the whole IT world is many of the systems we used to have on-premise uh, are, are now third-party software as a service or some sort of cloud-provided uh, system. Uh, and even in education, many of the tools that we use for student assessment and for all of these things, they are, many of them, very cloud-based. Um, and so, of course, with that comes concerns about, you know, is there student data that lives in the cloud? Who's in charge of it? You know. In the United States, we have what's called FERPA, uh, which is, for lack of a better understanding, the HIPAA of the education world, so to speak. Um, it has to do with student records and who can access them. Um, but, uh, you know, we have also uh, requirements for filtering for the students, uh, our SIPA requirements uh, in, in the United States. Uh, if we want to have E-rate funding, we have to prove that we are doing the, at least the minimums for SIPA requirements. Uh, to make sure that those children are protected when they're connected to the internet, um, mm -hmm. that they can just happen upon something and we've done our due diligence to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, obviously, we can't stop everything, um, but at least we have those, those structures in place. And uh, as we move forward, all of those types of solutions, we use a, in, in our district a, a product called Lightspeed uh, that is a cloud-based product that can live on the devices we send home and that client connects to the, our cloud infrastructure that is designed for us to manage what those kids can and can't access from that device. Now, again, that's the devices we own. Devices that we don't own, at this point, we're not actually managing what those devices can and can't do. But there are ways that we could, if we wanted to, uh, it would require some parental uh, sign on, you know, you know, parental um, uh, acknowledgement and say, okay, we're going to take control of this device, which is kind of a scary world for most of us to think about, but it, it's possible. Yeah, absolutely. It is definitely possible. It's just uh, another one of those things that hasn't necessarily been required as a use case in education, but as you have the shifting landscape, now we're looking to apply, apply technology that has been accessible towards uh, education more and more. Uh, Dr. Bassam, I have a question for you related mm -hmm. to the priorities and uh, with IT investments and going preparing for the next school year. What are those priorities for Leeds Beckett, specifically for safety precautions uh, and facilitating agile 
working environments for the students and the staff? I mean, the priority for, for, for uh, the foremost priority is to make sure that the infrastructure of the university is secure. Um, and the data that we have, or whether it is student data, research data, is also secure. So with, with, with the move to remote uh, working, remote teaching, that has uh, led to having uh, or forcing us to open so many holes in our defenses, if you like, to enable the lack of VPNs, remote desk, uh, top access, and web access to applications as well as data. And we, with that, we had to effectively to change shift, if you like, um, to bring in better tools or enhance existing tools to ensure that we have the security in place to, uh, to protect the, the, uh, the data and the jewels of the institution, if you like. Um, as we know, uh, universities and schools are, are perceived as easy target for hackers and uh, ransomware, et cetera. So that has been, if you like, a priority for us to make sure uh, with all colleagues being working from home, students accessing uh, data and to uh, services remotely, that uh, the infrastructure can withstand that sort of uh, attacks, if you like. But also uh, by increasing the security measures you don't want to strangle, if you like, access to, so you have to balance it. And the education of, of our users go hand in hand with that. Then, as uh, Rick said, uh, there is more and more, we are moving towards cloud services. So we have a number of services that is provided as a service. Um, and that will continue to increase because it gives us access um, anywhere, anytime, any place, much easier than on on-premise uh, tools. Um, that comes with all sorts of uh, health warning as well, because as Rick said, do you know where the data is held? Where the uh, uh, like uh, in the US, we have GDPR here, where we have to abide by very strict rules and uh, and, and laws in terms of access to data. Uh, so that in itself restricts what you can do. So it is important that every time we go to cloud services, we ensure that the security uh, is within the, the laws, you know, abide by the laws of, 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 the, of the country and the European Union as we still, uh, even by name, uh, part of it. Uh, so uh, those are the major two priorities really is to ensure that the infrastructure can move forward in terms of meeting the demands of the institution and enabling the university to be as successful as it can be. Um, uh, and the, the other projects, if you like, uh, for now will be put aside to concentrate on how we're going to ensure us as a university uh, continue to deliver the business that we are in, and that is higher education. Uh, that makes total sense. Securing the environment, ensuring that data is not in the wrong hands, wrong but remote accessibility to yeah. these distributed yeah. environments, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce, how do you see uh, the school district leveraging IT to enforce and support those initiatives for safety precautions, like contact tracing or occupancy management amongst the district? You have several schools. How will IT be leveraged to support that need? IT is basically always, it's always, it began as communication and it always will be based in communication, whether it's computers or people, voice, video, whatever. Mm. Uh, when it comes to contract tracing and we, it specifically, we need to be able to, uh, we need to be able to, to track information. We gotta be able to track the data. We need to identify who was exposed, who wasn't exposed, who had contact, who didn't. Uh, we're we're small enough that we have a pretty good idea of what's going on, um, but we still have to make sure that we do it the right way. Uh, we have the you know we we have, it's and it, we're talking about it's 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 weird because we're almost skirting two areas. We're hitting FARPA on one side and HIPAA on the other, and we're trying to make everyone happy, whereas we're trying to share information with the, with our health departments, 
without violating uh, our HIPAA, our, our FERPA laws, and we're trying, they're trying to share information with us without violating their HIPAA law. It's becoming, um, it's becoming more about communication with everyone involved. And whether we're doing that communication through Zoom or whatever, uh, our big push in the last couple of years has been telemedicine uh, when it comes down to access to uh, our, one of our local, our regional uh, um, hospital here has, has rolled out telemedicine to area schools uh, where you can, if you don't have a nurse, which we don't have a nurse for the most part, um, we can access a nurse quickly and easily through video conferencing. They can do assessments. Um, and in, with COVID like it is, that's extremely important if, uh, we've trained our staff in quick assessments of students, whether it's fever or, or whatever. Uh, we can then hand off to telemed to make sure we actually have a, a diagnosis. They can, and then that's when we cross that barrier between uh, um, FERPA and HIPAA, and then the health department takes over and notifies and does the contact trace and all that for us. Um, when it comes down to occupancy management, for me, that's more about controlling our classrooms and our environments. Um, Technology allows us to do more in less space. It allows us to do to have that educational classroom wherever it needs to be, which is a whole different set of guidelines and problems. We don't know, um, but it allows us to really control and hopefully maintain our six foot distances. Maybe maybe we have to go to A B blocks. That's the big thing in education where you have some kids come Monday and Tuesday, some come Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, technology will allow us to do that without our students missing a beat in instruction. So uh, it's, it's like I said, it's one of those areas where we're, we were kind of doing it before and we're going to do it a whole lot faster and we hope it works. So. First of all, very uh -huh. cool that you're leveraging telemedicine for the, for the nurses, right, for the student health. But also, I feel kind of bad for the students because back in the day, that was like the best prime spot to hide out in is the nurse's office. Just, oh, don't feel good. I don't think the isolation room is where you want to be nowadays. So. Nope, not anymore. Yeah. Anyway, when you call it the quarantine room, it's the isolation room. So yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's stuff like that. It's, it's understanding that, there's, there, that we have technology that gives us access to resources we've never had before, at least on campus. Uh, and even in rural, rural Oklahoma, whereas I've got social economic poverty levels, everything thrown against us. Uh, a regional, we have a, a small regional hospital next door in the adjacent town. Our next level one trauma center is Little Rock or Tulsa. So we're, you're talking a helicopter ride to a level one trauma center. So we, we kind of have to leverage what we have to get access to what we need. So, um, Can I add to the contact tracing? Um, I think IT is not just about contact tracing. I think there is a more important role IT can play in that sense where um, IT can be used to effectively measure the engagement uh, of students with the classes, especially in universities where we're all adults and so on. But what you want to do is to use the technology to spot those vulnerable students who might not be engaged to a point where they might drop out. But if you catch them early, at an early stage, then you might be able to help them recover and uh, become successful and stay at university. In the past, it was to, you know, you only catch them too late when they are about to leave, uh, to say, I'm leaving the university. Whereas now we use the technology, whether it is location, so using the wireless network to uh, find where you've been, if you like, in terms of have you been to the library, have you been to the labs, etc. And you put it through uh, an intelligent uh, algorithm to find out how much you are engaged in, in your studies. Uh, and that, seem, uh, that has helped a number of students to, being from, uh, to stop them from dropping out of university. And that will be more and more in use in universities because we all I mean, I remember going to the U.S. Uh, uh, three, four years ago when uh, completion rate within the U.S. is very low compared to, for example, Europe. Um, even in Europe, it's too low as well. So what we've been looking at is using the technology and harvesting the data that is collected through our wireless network and other uh, uh, tools, software tools, to improve in student engagement and retention. And that's good for the students and good for the universities from uh, a business point of view. 
Absolutely. The, uh, the network is the nerve central yeah. system of the entire operations that we see going forward. There's, it's, it's increased touch points through the network so you can leverage that to assess your benchmarks. Nice. Um, but Dr. Bassam, thank you so much for adding that. And Bruce, I would love to get your input as well on, you know, going forward, how would you see uh, leveraging the technology to the, the evolving future of education? How do you measure those benchmarks that he was talking about as well in K-12 from a student retention, engagement, and performance perspective? What are your thoughts on that? Well, the gap in instruction caused by COVID, uh, it's, for most of my students, it's been about five months since they've had, they've been in a classroom and it's about that, it's probably since they've had some instruction considering, depending on their engagement levels. Uh, in short, they lost about half a year of instruction. Uh, we will start our school year immediately going to benchmarks as soon as we possibly can in order to tailor those instructional plans for hybrid and, all, and, and, hybrid and traditional learning. Uh, all of our instruction, regardless of whatever delivery method we use, has to be held to the same standards and quality. We, that includes our state and local standards as well. The problem is, is adhering to these standards both in and out of the classroom. Uh, we don't, it, like I said, there's gonna be some cases where students are transitioning from synchronous to asynchronous, back and forth due to COVID or isolation or quarantine possibly. Uh, this transition can't add to that gap. Uh, we're already dealing with that huge gap anyway, and our job is to close it. In all of these cases, we have to be able to track performance. Uh, and in our case, that's going to be it. How much, how much instruction, how much are they mastering our state objectives? Uh, this means putting reliable equipment in their hands, uh, making sure they have access to both state and local benchmarks through, through uh, cellular modems, through whatever technology we can put in their hands. And we have, it, it all boils down to we have to be prepared for instruction at school, home, or wherever that learning is going to take place. Uh, Technology is the bridge to let us get there. Uh, benchmarking for us, it's part, of our, it's part of our daily work. We have to assess the students where they are and mastery is skill. Uh, technology has allowed us to do that quicker and faster than ever with the least amount of, of um, interruption in the learning process. Uh, we, we start out with digital benchmarking. Now we want to uh, we have intelligent AIs that dynamically plan instruction based on benchmarking. Uh, all that is great and it does their job amazingly. It comes down to two things. Uh, how easy is it to use and how and will it be used by my teachers? Uh, and that boils down to training and exposure. Uh, yes, absolutely. We have to have those two things. Um, we have, as a district, we have to make sure that they have adequate training in place. They have to instill it in the, instill in them the uh, importance of using it, and that we're not if we're dedicating money and resources to that software, to that hardware, to whatever, you, we're, you better buy in. <laughs> That's what it boils down to. We'll give you the training. When you have problems, we'll help you through it. But this is our expectations. Uh, I once had a, I, I had a boss years and years ago tell me he goes um, he goes I'm going to tell you my expectations so you can exceed them. Great, that that works well mm -hmm. for me. You know. Uh, but if, you, if I didn't tell you what they were, I can't get on to you for not meeting them. So Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, if we don't tell them what their expectations are and assess and track them through benchmarks to get there, how can we be, how can we uh, fail them for not getting there? There you go. You got to know what you're measuring against. <laughs> and that there's no other way to measure student performance and engagement and those, uh, you know, retention rates for university and et cetera, when we're not sure of what we're measuring against. Rick, I, as we wrap up this conversation, which you all have been so rich in your discussion, I appreciate it so much. What are some final thoughts from you on uh, the evolution of, of education and what are you excited about uh, going forward? What's the silver lining that's come out of it and what you expect to see going forward in education? Well, I'm excited to see um, <clears throat> how this all plays out with the actual engagement, not just from students, but from our staff in using the and leveraging these tools that they now have access to and have really started to, some of them fully embrace, uh, some of them have actually started to take a look at them and, and use them, begrudgingly some of them, uh, but to see where this goes and, and see how far we can take education from where it's been to where we've, uh, some of us idealists have wanted to see it go. 
Um, and I think the, the primary factors to making that happen are going to be making sure that we have time in, in the staff schedule to be trained on how to use these mm -hmm. and then provide that training and those resources as much as we can so that any moment of spare time they have, they can be learning how all of these um, systems can function, interact, and always building on the foundations that we're starting with. We have to, of course, start and get good foundations for how to use these tools, but th some of them are so feature rich that you really, unless you're a high flying teacher, you're not gonna really take advantage of most of those tools and capabilities. But for those that just get their feet wet, to be able to keep building and providing more resources for them to continually move down the road and really start to adopt fully uh, these tools. Yes, absolutely. It seems like a very strategic relationship that will be morphed between IT support and, and the operations within the school and the learning experiences itself, how it's applied as well. Uh, working together as two functions to creatively apply the technology to their needs in the classroom and outside of the classroom. Again, thank you all so much again for joining me today, for sharing your input and sharing with, with everyone viewing today, what are the priorities that they should be focused on from a digital trends perspective in education and also those IT considerations that will support and enable those trends to come to fruition. Well, I wanna thank you again for joining me today. And as a reminder for those viewing, this webinar was recorded and we will be emailing it to you within the next 48 hours. Thank you and have a great day.